registrando ci non è stato dove continua a registrare che vediamo che la cosa I'm going to look that up in the deck stream when I get back. Do you really want us to do this? Yeah, well, th th this is a very special part in the show, you know? Some people right. just laugh halfway through the poem. Some people oh, get good. so That's inspired. Right. We're going to laugh at the end of it, okay? Yeah, I mean, you could do every... It's a provocation, right? You don't, okay, you good, don't good, have good. to be a poet and recite correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so people, you know, just start laughing halfway through. I go, I can do it. I mean, it's cool anyway. Babbo, se stiamo registrando, intanto posso fare le altre domande. Vado. Ah. Okay. We, we can do the. the Quali sono so, Blue Night? Blue Night, questo. Uh, we can start with the other questions. So when Claire is here, we can we can check out what asked. It doesn't means. matter what it means. It's better that we don't know. More fun. Okay. Go ahead then. All yours. Ah. <laughs> Violan Ginsberg and Asphodel. Oh dear sweet rosy unattainable desire, how sad, no way to change the mad cultivated Asphodel. <laughs> Sorry, the visible reality. And skin's appalling petals, how inspired to be so lying in the living room, drunk, naked and dreaming in the absence of electricity, over and over eating the low root of the Asphodel. Grey fate. What's an asphodel? <laughs> I have no idea. I think mine's itching anyway. Cheers, <laughs> 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 Alan. Away. A great one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> He's got a whole book of this shit. <laughs> Didn't he die recently? <laughs> asphodel poisoning, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you might break it. Okay, cool. Are we ready to start with the serious part of the Blue Night thing? No, oh, I enjoyed this oh, one. This <laughs> <laughs> I like this. This is great. Yes. Okay, first off, was... why the title is all Blue Rock? Ah. Well, it's very like Blue Night. So <laughs> we thought, in tribute to the program, we'd call it that. Okay. What rapport have you with images that portray your group video clips, stage sets, and all that kind of stuff? It's, it's a difficult thing, yeah. You have sort of ideas, and then you get them done, and, and by the time it all, it's all finished, you usually find that it's nothing like you wanted. You sort of lost control somewhere on the way, so things end up usually looking very different to what, how you expected. It's a very difficult thing to do to get something looking exactly as you wanted it to look when you had the idea. You have to control each stage, I think. Don't you? Mm. We started out with our very first video, Power to Love, with um, a big production, decadent thing. Which sort was of an asphodel. An asphodel kind of thing, yeah. And, um, and that was good fun to do, and it looked quite impressive. But on this newer one, we've gone for a much more starker, closer thing. And um, I think that's more in tune with the way we are now. We've been playing on the road for a long time this year. And um, so the new Dark Ages visual look is more representative of the way the band is now. What is your definition of successful male? Who do you think is a male sex, sex symbol? Sex symbol. I'd say a male sex symbol at the moment would be somebody like Kevin Costner, probably, because I think a lot of women fancy him. Alan Ginsberg, I suppose. <laughs> and the man with the asphodels. What's your definition of a successful male? Well, you could do it on several levels. I mean, you could say somebody who's, on a biological level, somebody who's got uh, lots of children and they all get on. <laughs> um, a successful male, that's difficult. Depends where you're coming from. If you're talking about a kind of hero, musical heroes, I look at somebody like Stevie Wonder and I think that the man has got a lot of talent and has had a successful career and to look back on, you know, given people a lot of enjoyment. So I, I've always regarded him as being successful artistically. He's a terrible driver, though. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an indispensable object that you couldn't live without if you had to go on an island with only one thing? What would you bring with you? All oh, right, I'll bring my mobile telephone. <laughs> I think that's the, 
because you can always switch it off. I think <laughs> um, it's the best uh, invention in the last 20 years, I think. I think it's fantastic. How about you? Swiss Army knife, in case you've got things in horses' hooves that you have to dig out, you know, and a corkscrew, it's all there, you know. You can get Boy Scouts out of horses' hooves. And yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is it for Blue Knight. Eh, ragazzi, tutto per Blue Knight. Sistema paleolitico di comunicazione. They're all asleep. It's the biggest little asphodel in the world. I can't wait to ask Claire. She must know. Oh, Attilio. Oh, babè. Dimmi tutto. È finito Blue Knight. Adesso si fa archivio. Che bello. We are professionals. To um, contest, right? In Genoa and in Milan and in Rome, we're going to have this huge celebration in 1992 that they built new places to celebrate this. But there are groups uh, here in Italy that are ready to, to, to boycott every um, celebration of the 500-year anniversary. Like, that they spent a lot of money in Genoa to build statues and new places where to celebrate this that are going to be use, useless once the celebration is over. Instead of building, for example, b basketball courts or mm, yeah. places for, for people to, to have fun, especially in, 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 the, in the poorer areas sure. of the cities, that would have mm. been more useful. Okay, we're ready. Do you believe that the new international balances will be formed due to the changes in the Eastern Bloc countries? Yes, I, I imagine the, the whole face of Europe will, will, will change. And it, I think it'll take a long time and there'll be many problems on the way. I'd like to think that the, all of Europe will get together and, and work as one block, though, because I think it would be a great force in the world, in the center of the world. It's a shame that this, um, the ethnic problems have broken out in the eastern, eastern states, um, and it seems that the only thing that's going to stop that is some kind of is the EC exerting pressure on them, it's only an economic thing. You can't wave sticks at people anymore and guns and say, stop fighting, otherwise we're going to blow you up. So it looks as though the, um, the common market or the EC will become an actual force for peace, which is uh, uh, an unusual thing. In 1942, Christopher Columbus discovered America. In 1992, we will celebrate the 500-year anniversary of this discovery. What do you think about the controversy which surrounds this event? This is something we don't know very much about in England, uh, so because it's obviously it's the event is here. And, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't really know what all the fuss is about. So I, don't, I thought I mean, they proved that it wasn't him that found it anyway. <laughs> we, we're not asking you what you think about the, 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 the celebration that we're going to have in Italy and in the States for this, but what do you think about the, 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 the um, thing in general? We're celebrating because of, uh, a man discovered a land that had its own culture, its own inhabitants. I see what you mean, yeah, yeah. Well, he only discovered it for this side of the world, really. Didn't he? I think the Indians were... I, don't, I, I really don't know about this, actually, because I haven't thought about it. So I, it's a very difficult question. I think it's interesting that um, it, it was discovered 500 years ago, but it's been in this century that America has grown to be the most powerful nation on Earth and has already fallen into decline with the shifting of balance of power coming back towards Europe. So it seems that empires grow and die much quicker these days. Ecology. The mass media has elected this as the uh, subject of the decade. Is this just an in argument for the industrialized the rich nations, or is this our planet's last chance? Well, I think that, um, no, I think it is important. I think people's attitude towards it is definitely changing. I mean, you can now, for example, you sit in a car, and if you watch a lorry go by that's belching out fumes and smoke, people are offended by that. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, they probably wouldn't have thought anything of it. And I think it's good that it's coming down to everybody's consciousness that you can't just throw your rubbish on the floor. You can't just tip things into the rivers because everybody's contribution does make a difference. Mm. I mean, I'm quite cynical and I think a lot of people sort of jump on this bandwagon because it is a sort of almost a fashionable thing. But I mean, it is vital, I think, that 
people's awareness of it. And people's awareness has changed because my son, for instance, in the schools, he's very you know, concerned about, um, am I using lead-free petrol? And you know, they know about the rainforest and they're taught about that. And I think it is absolutely vital now that the people's conception of the way we treat the environment is changing. And, uh, and it is our last chance, I would say, probably. Um, so that's a good thing. But it's also true to say that people get it wrong. I and mean, There's a lot of um, scaremongering uh, about it. I mean, this business in Kuwait with all the oil fires were burning, um, and they said it was going to take however long to put them out. And this week, they, they put the last one out, which is sort of eight months after the disaster started. The very next day, I got a letter from an ecology group asking for money to put towards the putting out of the oil fires because it would take over 10 years to put them all out, you know. And so you're actually bombarded with a lot of propaganda as well. Um, so you have to sort of try and sift out the reality of it. Right. Uh, we often hold concerts in order to sustain humanitarian initiatives. This has to do with your last uh, answer. Does the mu multiplication of these events risk its losing its credibility? It's a bit Definitely. Yes, um, fatigue does set in and people yeah. do get tired of doing it for the right thing. Um, it's a question of timing, I suppose, and also if you... Uh, it's a shame, you, though, because who else is going to do it? Yeah, politicians don't do anything, really, for people's genuine good, I think. The, the only thing politicians think about is their own votes. and, uh, and that, So that's not going to come from them. So it, it has to come from... Uh, Ordinary people, I suppose, you know, and I suppose these concerts are, are one way, but you're right. As Bob Geldof called it compassion fatigue. People do get fed up with, uh, with all those charity things. I and think. you also get fed up with some artists who exploit that for their own gain. I mean, uh, after the original Live Aid thing, which was fairly genuine, and I think everybody did it for the right reasons, there were a few more so-called charity concerts in London, and you see the record shops would be full of all the artists' albums that were doing those shows, so that you could guarantee that all their records would be back in the charts the next day, which I think is um, the wrong side of the, of the concerts. That's the record business being very cynically using the event, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Can't blame them there. Gotta make a buck. <laughs> Do you believe that video clips are an artistic manifestation or a commercial necessity? I think some of them have been artistic manifestations. Some of them have been uh, manifestations. Um, Asphodels. <laughs> yeah. Um, but unfortunately, they, they became. I mean, uh, my other group, Queen, was right in at the beginning of video. And uh, then they, it was just a new thing. But they've become a whole necess commercial necessity and a part of the music industry. And uh, I think it's a shame in some ways, but uh, because I mean, it's much more expensive to make the video than it is to make the record. And that seems to be the wrong way around in some ways. But they are, they are a necessity these days if you want great success, yeah. Are there any particular ep ep episodes uh, tied to the making of one of your videos? Funny things that happened. You always just get drunk when you make a video. It takes so long, you know. <laughs> Everything seems funny. <laughs> um, well, on the, on the new one, New Dark Ages, there's a, it's a very dark video, and there's some, some people in there, and I think there's some animals in there. Some, is, there a, is there a vulture or a bird or something in there? Well, there's some, all kinds of props in there, but we didn't actually see them being used because we did our bit and then left. But just at the time when all the guys who were covered in oil and the birds were going in, they brought in a sheep. And I, <laughs> I couldn't see the relevance of covering a sheep with oil to stick in the video. Although I quite like the idea now, but... Uh, <laughs> you must have missed it. The... You didn't see the guy in the Wellington booth? Ah, oh, right. Oh, that's, that's the Australian there. Yeah, yeah okay. What is the relationship you have with your public? Does this relationship have a particular element of sentiment which characterizes it? Well, actually, I think our public are a wonderful couple. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're very, on very good terms with them. Um, I met my public in Germany, and uh, I signed an autograph, and uh, he was English, and he said he lived next door to my mum in this. <laughs> so, hello, Frank. Hi. <laughs> 
Okay, one last thing, just a station break. Hi, we are, we are The Cross, you are watching video music. Okay. Hello, I'm Spike. I'm Roger, we're The Cross, and you're watching video music. Perfect. Thanks. We're done. Ah. Ah, prima. So, in the, in the 60s, at the end of the Beatles era, the musical scene offered many different groups proposing heterogeneous styles, from Led Zeppelin's hard rock to the rock blues of the new Rolling Stones, and again innovative and experimental groups like Pink Floyd. We lived in the 60s like a period of great doubt. In essence, how were those years? Wow. Ah. I think the end of the 60s was the biggest, was the most important era in uh, popular music, really, that especially that I remember. I remember just an explosion of great artists uh, and ideas, people like Led Zeppelin, who you mentioned, I think, had, came right at the end of the 60s, but before then there was the Jimi Hendrix and the Eric Clapton, the rise of all that, many other acts and of course the Beatles and uh, who else? The um, thing was that it seemed that the quality of uh, the music and especially the charts at that time was much stronger. You look at any chart from that period and you can have uh, you know, half a dozen classic records in the chart and uh, that faded away towards the end of the 70s and especially yeah. in the 80s you don't have the quality of the, the songwriting or the production ideas. Things have become very narrow now whereas back then it seemed that everybody was looking for new and different ways of doing things. Everybody's looking to do things the same way these days like dance records or mm. the heavy metal scene seems to be narrow instead of wider. You had the whole whole soul scene also that came up then and the Motown scene as well mm. and it was a really fertile fantastic period I think and some great performance artists as well Hendrix probably being the best of the lot as a musician you were a pr protagonist of the 70s an incredible decade in a short time we witnessed the birth and the death of many groups and musical styles <laughs> an example punk rock as a musician how did you live this constantly changing times I think when you look back, the 70s were a bad decade. Uh, I don't think much good, uh, not a lot of good stuff came out. There was some, uh, there was some really great stuff like Queen. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, I love this guy. Uh, <laughs> he makes me laugh. No, um, there, I mean, there were some great things, and I love the Sex Pistols. First album was great. But I don't think the 70s was a very interesting decade when you look back at it. And especially at this, clothes were terrible. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it was strange really. I don't think, I think things did move fast because there was so much rubbish, so much crap, you know. They had to move fast. I just hated the way that um, the end of the 70s, when the punk thing came, the positive thing was the excitement because things had become a little bit tired by then. But then it seemed that if it wasn't punk, then it wasn't cool at all. And so every other kind of music or musician got put to one side. And it took until about the mid to late 80s for people to turn around and say, well, hey, Led Zeppelin weren't so bad after all, you know, because they became very unfashionable at the end of the 70s. Yeah, in fact, the punk attitude, that saying, if it's not punk and, uh, at the time, it was just as reactionary as the stuff that it was moaning about. You know. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. Yeah. I think. What pushes a, a musician who has lived a rich and intense musical reality like that of Queen to form another group? Well, boredom. No, um, I, I just wanted to do it. Uh, I wanted to try something else. Uh, and Queen is not a hard working group anymore like it used to be. It's an older group. Um, and it only needs to do a certain amount, and I don't think it should do too much, you know. 
Um, people don't want more records pushed at them every three months. Uh, so I think it's good just to take it easy in Queen. And the cross, I, I do a different job in a different group, you know, so it was interesting. I, I love the music. You obviously have reached a certain musical maturity. How do you see today's teenagers and this new musical scene from Manchester with groups like Happy Mondays and Stone Roses? I think they're crap. Um, I think those two groups, personally, I, I think are very disappointing. As I've heard everything they do, I've heard before. I can't hear one new idea in there. And they seem to have drawn from a lot of influences from the 60s. Um, to me, and I suppose it's, it's all about a dance thing and a, and a fashion scene, really. And I can't, I find it hard to relate to or like. I quite like EMF. I think they've got something oh, yeah, like about them, them uh, some, some originality. But um, it's a shame that dance seems to have degenerated into uh, a noise thing, whereas some, like in the 60s and 70s, you had some great songs that were also great dance records from artists like, you know, the Motown artists or Wilson Pickett or James Brown or something like that. And we've lost that a bit. And um, I, I miss good songs on the dance scene. Okay. This is, this is it for Metropolis. Uh, Babbo, basta Metropolis, archivio adesso. <laughs>